Uh, How did Jesus know what he came to do? Uh, When Jesus was walking the earth 2,000 years ago, uh, when he was a boy, when he was in his ministry, when he was walking to Jerusalem before his crucifixion, uh, how did he know what he was going to do? Uh, Jesus came to earth uh, on a mission, but, but how did he know what his mission was? Well, Jesus said a very interesting thing before his betrayal and his arrest and his death. Uh, He said something that that tells us how he knew. Uh, When the authorities came to arrest him, he let it all happen. Uh, And he said, let the scriptures be fulfilled. Uh, He was saying, I need to be arrested. I need to be hated. I need to die because the scriptures say so. Jesus knew what he came to do uh, because it had already been written down for him uh, centuries beforehand. Uh, Jesus read the Old Testament uh, and he knew uh, this is what he had to do. He had to be the man, uh, be the Messiah that the Old Testament prophesied would come. You can think of the Old Testament as Jesus' mission briefing. So uh, like soldiers uh, have, uh, go into battle, uh, they get a mission briefing beforehand from the general, don't they? And the general says, uh, here's the mission. Here's what you need to do. This is the man you need to be. You need to go behind enemy lines uh, and you need to rescue hostages. And it's going to be brutal. You're going to take bullets. But, but when you come home, you're going to receive a hero's welcome. You're going to be praised by everyone. Well, when Jesus read the Old Testament, this is what he saw. He saw his mission. He saw what he had to do. The Old Testament is Jesus' mission briefing. And this passage in particular that we're looking at today, Jesus knew he had to fulfill this. In this passage, God promises something. He promises he will send someone, someone called his servant, to save the world. To pour out unending forgiveness and grace onto sinners. This passage prophesies of a coming man, the servant, who will once for all deal with our sin. And Jesus read this passage and knew, I came to be this man. I came to be this servant. I came to go behind enemy lines and rescue my people. This is Jesus' mission briefing. And that's how we need to read it today. And in these verses, we will see Jesus came to be two things. And the first thing is this. Jesus came to be exalted. Jesus came to be exalted. Uh, look Look at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. God shows us his servant, this man, and says, Behold, look, my servant shall act wisely. Now, the meaning of act wisely isn't so much about his knowledge or or the wisdom of his mind, but it's more about the success of his mission. So it's not that uh, Jesus isn't wise. That's definitely not the case. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But this wisdom here, it's more about the success of his mission. He will have the wisdom to know how to get the job done and get it done perfectly. He will act wisely so that his mission will be successful. So, So a soldier doesn't know if he will complete his mission He doesn't know if he'll save the hostages, but Jesus knew. He knew that he would act wisely. And he knew that there was glory waiting for him at the end. So look at the next line. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. This looks to the future, to the end of the servant's mission, to his homecoming, And God says he shall be exalted. Uh, This means held up, 
praised, glorified. He will be above everyone else in glory and honour. And he, he shall be high and lifted up. Now this phrase, high and lifted up, it's only used two other times in Isaiah. And both times it speaks of God. In Isaiah 57, God is said, God is the one who is high and lifted up. And in Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees the very throne of God in heaven. And he says, I saw the Lord God sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. So when God says this servant will be high and lifted up, it means he will be enthroned with God in heaven. He will have all the power and authority of God over creation. So he won't just be exalted as a successful soldier. He will be exalted as God reigning in the highest of heavens. This is what Jesus knew was waiting for him. The glory of the throne of God itself was at the end of his mission. And we can see that in the Gospels. Jesus knew his mission. Jesus prays to the Father in John 17. Father, glorify me in your own presence. He knows glory awaits him. When Jesus had his trial in front of the chief priests and the elders, what does he say to them? You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. He knows what's at the end of his mission. Jesus read this mission briefing. He knew what he came for. He didn't come just to be a good example. He didn't come just to be a good influence on the culture. No, Jesus came to be exalted. He came to be king over you. And this is exactly what happened. This is what we confess in the Apostles' Creed on Sundays. What do we say as a church? I believe in Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. This second, right now, Jesus is not dead. This second, right now, Jesus isn't just an idea in your head that you cling to. No, right now, Jesus is alive with a resurrected body and he is exalted in the highest of heavens. This moment now, as you sit here, he sits at the right hand of God, reigning as the saviour of his church, as ruler of all creation. God has bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus Christ right now. Mission complete. The servant acted wisely. However, our passage doesn't stay at the heights of glory. In verse 14, there's a real gear shift. And we come down to the lowest of lows. And God says, yes, at the end of the mission, there will be glory. But to get there, the servant needs to suffer. And not just that, he needs to be butchered. And this is my second point today. Jesus came to be butchered. Jesus came to be butchered. Look at verse 14. As many were astonished at you. God addresses the servant directly here and says, many will be astonished at you. Well, it's actually many were astonished that the servant is spoken of in the past tense here, which is kind of a a stylistic device. It makes the the image more vivid. But but God is saying what will happen to this servant. And it says many will be astonished at him. And astonished here, it has a negative tone. It's more like shocked, appalled, aghast. That there's something about this servant that they're appalled at. And look what it is, verse 14. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind we see a picture of the servant and he's marred he's mutilated he's battered he's hacked to pieces 
And it's so bad, it says he's beyond human semblance. His form beyond that of the children of mankind. He's so physically marred, he doesn't even look human. People around him look at him and think, oh, I can barely say that's human. This is the dark, brutal low the servant needs to go through to then be high and lifted up. And this low is low. Jesus knew he had to go through great suffering to get to glory. And where did this happen? It was in the crucifixion. That was the deepest of all his suffering. And it was the route to his glory. But can we say this of the crucifixion? Was Jesus so marred beyond human semblance? Was his face somehow so shredded that he didn't look human? Well, I think we can say yes, but I think Isaiah is saying something more than the actual state of his face or body. Jesus was marred both in his wounds and in the way he was treated. Think about this. When does a cow stop being a cow and become meat? So you get a slab of steak on your table. You don't call that a cow, do you? You call it meat. And why? Well, because it's butchered. It's mutilated. It's hacked to pieces. Visually, it stopped looking like a cow. You think no cow should look like that. It's marred beyond the semblance of a cow. But also, when it's butchered... How is the meat then treated and handled? Not like a cow anymore. It's treated like an object, isn't it? It's moved around like an object, like a piece of meat hung up on a hook. And you know, that's not how you treat a cow. That's meat. In the way it looks and in the way it's treated, it really has become marred beyond the semblance of a cow. Well, that was Jesus. Jesus was whipped with whips that had sharp teeth. He was beaten with a reed over his head. He was struck and bruised and pierced. A crown of sharp thorns placed on his fragile head. He was nailed through his hands and his feet. So when you look at Jesus on the cross... You can't help but think no human should look like that. That is not what a human should look like. Those wounds shouldn't belong on a human. That that man is marred beyond the semblance of a human. And not only that, how was Jesus treated? He was mocked, spat on, ridiculed, laughed at. The, The night before his death, He was passed around the Jewish courts and the authorities like an object to be judged. Abuse was hurled at him. Then he was hung up on a tree like a piece of meat. All that, that's not how you treat a human. That is subhuman treatment. That's how you handle meat. On the cross, Jesus was butchered. The Son of God was sent to a slaughterhouse. The word really became meat. Jesus came to be butchered. And this is all part of his mission briefing. This was how he would reach glory. Because look what comes from this butchering, verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. From this butchering, he shall sprinkle many nations. Now, this is priestly language. This is the language of sprinkling blood to deal with sin. Through this butchering, this servant will bring the forgiveness of sins. And not just to a few people, but to many nations 
the servant will be exalted in heaven and exalted by many nations on earth. And you want proof of that? Look around you now. England, America, Northern Ireland, Japan. Many nations have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. We are only here today because Jesus was butchered. This was a a rescue mission for the world. And forgiveness has now come to the guilty. The guilty across many nations all through this butchered man. And this sprinkling is for everyone who will believe. Everyone who will believe in him from the smallest all the way up to the greatest. Because look how royalty will respond to this man. Verse 15. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. This forgiveness that he wins for the nations, it is so great. And his glory is so magnificent. Even monarchs will marvel in silence and awe before this butchered man. Kings and queens will bow before this mutilated servant. And this has been the case throughout the centuries. In fact, our late queen, Elizabeth II, she professed faith in this man. She is one of the monarchs Isaiah mentions here. The queen we would all bow down to, the queen we would all take a bullet for, the queen whom presidents and prime ministers bowed before, the queen for whom nations stood still in silence at the news of her death, that queen was struck into silence before this butchered man. Her majesty, the queen, stood in awe at his majesty. The queen who bows to no one, she is now bowing before his throne in heaven. The death of Jesus captures the hearts of even the greatest monarchs of history. And why? Because his blood brings the forgiveness of sins. And so let me ask, does he capture your heart? Does he silence you in awe? For those in Christ, do you realise as he was butchered, he was thinking of you? He didn't run away from the slaughterhouse. He went further into it because he was thinking of you. That was the only way to forgive your sin. He had to be treated subhuman to make you truly human. And so do you see, it is is not a light thing to have your sins forgiven. It is not something to take for granted. It is something to silence us. As we approach Good Friday this week, and as we consider the cross in our lives, this is what we need to do. We need to shut our mouths. We need to stand in awe at what Christ went through. We need to soberly reflect on the fact that the Son of God came not just to die, but to be butchered. And he did it for you. And if you haven't been sprinkled clean by this man, now is the time. He offers forgiveness to the nations and he offers it to you. So come join the multitudes and the kings and the queens who all all bow before this man. The world only finds forgiveness in this man, that the man who came to be butchered and the man who is now exalted in the highest of heavens. Let me pray. Thank you.